Uh, thank you all for being here. This is an exciting day. And if I forget to open the bag, somebody has to shout out, what's in the bag? <clears throat> because you will have gathered, having chosen to come here, you could be at home making pancakes. I mean, it's Shrove Tuesday, and you're here. We suggest you think this subject is important, and I'm glad about that. Now, my dad used to write pantomimes, so I'm very big on audience participation. You're not here to be a passive observer of these presentations. You're a participant. And we, the people in this room, and how nice it is to have people in a room in three dimensions, not just a little two-dimensional representation on a video screen. We are the ones that's going to make this happen. We and our colleagues who couldn't make it. They will rue the day that they were doing something else, making pancakes or going to work, that they weren't in this room. So what am I, I, I've been asked to talk about the state of our planet in 15 minutes. No. Uh, <laughs> we, I think you're all very familiar with the state of our planet. Most of you will have thought about this strange concept of planetary boundaries that we keep exceeding in different directions because of our, what we call our civilization, our modern way of life, our love of technology, of gizmos. And we're all part of it. We've all got some sort of a mobile device in our pocket, although it shouldn't be in your pocket. It should be some distance from you. Otherwise, you get all the problems with close contact. Um, we're so sort of swept away by the excitement of modern life that we sort of forget where we came from and what our connection is. Now, a lot of the reports that have been coming out looking at the state of a planet are looking at the past 50 years because that's for a human lifetime, which these days isn't just for three score and 10, but probably up to 100. 50 years is half, half a lifetime. And, and last year I celebrated my 50th anniversary of being an adult. I'm still waiting to grow up, but I, I am of an age where I can look back. And 50 years ago, I was a student. And when I graduated, I got to go and work with these guys, the mountain gorillas of Rwanda. For any biologist, any naturalist, that is an extraordinary opportunity. And the first gorilla I saw was Titus, which is why I often like to begin a lecture with a picture of Titus looking over his shoulder. But when I first saw him, he wasn't that size. He was just an infant being chased up a tree by his younger brother, Quayley. And if someone said, oh, we're going to put a price on Titus, value him in terms of dollars, I would be deeply offended. Because if you've worked with the great apes and the other large-brained intelligent social mammals, you come to think of them as not just wildlife, but as beings. This is a gorilla being. We're human beings. Chimpanzees are chimpanzee beings. And by being, I mean autonomous, self-aware, part of a society. And Titus did very well for himself. From the infancy, he was observed on the day he was born by Kelly Stewart, given the name Titus, and he lived for 35 years, which turns out is a reasonable age for a silverback. He sired lots of children. When you go to Rwanda today and visit the Titus group, it's actually Titus's son, Pato, who you'll meet. And when I first saw Pato, oh God, you've got a spitting image of your dad. <laughs> I couldn't explain that to him, but, but gorillas, as in humans, noses run in the family. So you can see the family resemblance. And when you have that connection with a close relative in the animal kingdom, it changes how you think about them and it changes how you think about us. But what about the economic value of Titus? He wasn't in a tourist group. There was no tourism then. So he had no economic value. Titus's um, younger brother, Quayley, was killed by poachers when he was an infant. It was a botched attempt to capture him and put him into trade, whereupon he would gain a value because you can sell a baby ape. Even today, it's illegal all under the, under the, uh, the guise of, uh, well, smuggling of, of apes is still a problem. But their economic value as a living ape in the forest was not appreciated. But Titus did well. He, he got together a big family, lots of females, lots of kids. And if you think of the ecological impact of that family of gorillas in the forest where they live, on the borders of Rwanda and what was then Zaire, is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is considerable. Another gorilla I met who became very famous, sadly because he was killed, was Digit. This is Digit. If you've read the book Gorillas in the Mist, if you haven't, please do. Uh, if you've seen the movie, which is a dramatized version 
of Diane Foss's life, you will know the name Digit. And he was an extraordinary individual until the point when he was speared by poachers. Now at that point, he went from an economic value of zero to $20. And in 1977, to a poverty-stricken farmer living near the National Park, $20 was a large sum of money. So by killing Digit, they created a value. Just after Digit was killed, literally days afterwards, this bloke turned up with a BBC film crew in, in tow to make a short sequence for Life on Earth, his first big blue chip natural history series. And David Attenborough changed people's attitudes to gorillas. In the 60s, surveys of school children had gorillas alongside spiders and sharks as the scariest, most horrible animals you could think of. And because of those scenes of a well-known TV presenter not only talking about the gorillas being sat upon by one of them, that's Pablo, the gorilla who sat on David Attenborough, Pablo and Titus both had big families and they both were very successful within their society. They spent their days, as Titus is doing here, stuffing their face with carefully selected bits of vegetation, which of course has an impact on the forest. Now, silverbacks might weigh up to 200 kilograms. And they eat, well, eight, 10 kilos of vegetation a day, which produces a lot of dung, which has a huge ecological impact on the forest, a positive impact. They also build nests each night, which pulls down vegetation, and leaves a pile of, of, of damaged plants, which gently decomposes. And in the dung, very likely, if they've been eating fruit the previous day, are seeds. So primates, in general, and other fruit-eating animals, that we'll come on to later, are seed dispersal agents. And so they're part of the regeneration of the forest. That has never been seen to have a value, an economic value. It's just of academic interest. So you would have read about the Living Planet Report last year, that we've lost this huge proportion of, of wild animals. Not, to, not the species, well, yes, species have gone extinct, but the ones that are still here are reduced in number. Their populations are dwindling. And the impact of that, when you think about it, Quayley was killed as an infant, Titus lived to 35. So if you look at the lifetime consumption of vegetation of a 35-year-old silverback, you're talking about tons of dung fertilizing the forest every year. And if the number of animals doing that is reduced by, on average, 69%, but for some species it's much higher, then that ecosystem role is reduced too. And we depend on these forests. Now, one of the things I did while I was at Karasoki was look at the parasites of gorillas. And one day I decided to follow Beats Me, who is a blackback male, so not yet the full silver size, but still probably bigger than a female. And I collected every piece of dung that he produced that day and weighed it. And it was just over five kilograms. And he's going to grow into silverback, and so that will probably double by the time he's at full size. And you start to quantify that ecological impact. Now, at these big intergovernmental meetings, very few people are talking about gorilla dung, which I think is a shame. I have tried to <laughs> inject it into the conversation on a number of occasions at different COPs. COP27, yep, we're all focused on the climate and the forest and the importance of forests. And pol political leaders are saying, oh, we're going to plant trees, billions of trees, trillion trees. Where are they going to put them all? Isn't it a better idea to look after the trees we've got and make those forests more efficient? How can we do that? Animals. Animals is a missing part. Last night, I went to a wonderful lecture by uh, Professor Marley, Marley from Oxford University, Professor of Ecology. Uh, he's coming this afternoon. He'll be around. Um, and he was talking about these planetary boundaries. And uh, when I asked him about the role of animals in the forest, he said, they don't appear in our models. So they're doing these wonderful, they're collecting data from the three main tropical forest blocks to better understand the ecology, and animals aren't in the models. I can't tell you how disappointing that was to hear, but it, it, his work is extremely important, and we can inject 
the role of animals because now we have data. This, in case you hadn't realized, is a pile of elephant poo, elephant dung. You think gorillas eat a lot of vegetation. Elephants are the biggest uh, uh, land animal and they eat about 4% of their body weight a day. So a five ton elephant is eating 200 kilograms and most of that is coming out the other end as dung. And that's what happens a few weeks afterwards. Now I had the good fortune to study these elephants. These are the elephants of Mount Elgin in Kenya. And you'll notice they have surprisingly short tusks. And that's because we haven't got time to go into great detail. They go deep underground to mine rock. What? If you didn't know about that, well, you haven't been paying attention. Um, I've been writing articles about this for years. Um, but the, their, their behavior is, is an example of elephant culture. They shape the environment in a very real way. These, these caves that they go into are huge, and they're a result of elephant erosion. And the rock that they eat, which is rich in sodium ions, doesn't taste salty, it's sodium sulfate, not sodium chloride, is carried out of the cave in their guts. So every year the cave gets a bit bigger and a bit bigger and a bit bigger. And what an extraordinary phenomenon. So that's, that's um, a, an interaction which I had with a young male elephant who had pointy tusks. So some of these elephants do keep their tusks. And we have filmed cooperative mining, where one's mining and the other one's picking up the bits. And it wasn't like stealing, it was, it was in a friendly cooperative way. So just fascinating behavior. And we're so interested in the behavior of elephants and gorillas that we kind of forget what they're for, what they do, and what the impact on the ecology is of an incident like this. <coughs> this is one of our trackers in the Mount Elgin elephant monitoring team, the meme team, standing beside the body of a male elephant who was known to the trackers as Big Tembo. And Big Tembo was one of the ones that still had quite pointy tusks. And he was killed at an age of about 45. So he might have lived another 15 years or more. Elephants produce about one metric ton of dung per week, 52 weeks a year, times 15. That's the loss that no one calculates. They think, oh, the poor elephant, and he shouldn't be killed for his tusks. This is a tusk that was confiscated by customs. And people think this is the valuable bit of an elephant. If you kill the elephant, you can carve it. But this particular tusk was in the face of a young elephant. We know it's a young elephant. Look at the, the wide base, the narrow point. That was a young male elephant who would have died as a teenager. So he wouldn't have passed on his genes. His family line is gone. Because that was considered more important than that. That's an example of an elephant chewed branch. Elephants eat twigs and leaves, but also the bark of branches, and they're tearing down trees, and that seems to be destructive. But it's not the white bit that sticks out the front of an elephant that is important. It's, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this that comes out the back end of the elephant. And it's important because elephants do eat seeds. Here's an example of seed pods that elephants like to eat. You can hear the seeds in them. Under the tree, these get invaded by weevils. They've got lots of little holes in them where weevils have, have eaten the seeds, the, the larvae of the weevils. But when they're inside an elephant, they get carried away to where there are very few weevils. And they're planted in a nice packet of manure. And that is what elephants do. That's why they're so important. Now, our scientific officer, uh, Fabio Berzaghi, calculated that in a forest with elephants, compared to a forest where they were extirpated decades ago, there's about a 7% difference of above ground biomass. Now, if elephants can make 7% in the amount of carbon in a forest, that makes elephants extremely valuable. You'll be hearing later how Ralph Sharmi, our other co-founder, calculated that value. The UN has called this the decade of ecosystem restoration. And the Internet is full of pictures of people's hands holding trees. And it's important if we've killed all the animals for us to take on that role. But how much better to think how many thousands of seeds an elephant produces every year and value that. And if we, as we now know, the forest has more biomass with elephants and gorillas and other herbivores, then that puts a value on those animals. And the rebalance earth model is extraordinary because it, it, it brings the value of these ecosystem services 
rendered not just by whole ecosystems, but by individual animals of keystone species into the economy. Now, when Digit was killed, Diane set up the Digit Fund and asked the public to help. And that became the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund in America and, and the Gorilla Organization here in London. And we continue to fund our projects with philanthropy. At the end of the month, if somebody's got a bit of spare money and they care about gorillas, they'll send it to a charity. And for mountain gorillas, it's worked because when I started, there were estimated 250 in the Virungas, and now there's more than 600. Whoa, what a result! But they're the only kind of ape, apart from ourselves, whose numbers are increasing. And only in a very tenuous way. There's just over a thousand now of mountain gorillas in the two populations. These big UN decisions and, and finance task force and, and so on are, are important. But it still feels like conservation is over there. It's not integrated into our daily lives in everything we buy. If you bought a bottle of wine, and I wonder if this is going to work. Oh, well, this is, this is a new understanding of gorillas and elephants and the role they play. And, and this is Mugaruka, another gorilla I knew well, eating Mirianthus fruit. And, and yes, you, you, I mean, it's nice to watch him, but, but I'm told I've got two minutes. Um, <laughs> that's what happens the next day. The, the dung is full of seeds, and, and the next generation of Mirianthus. Mirianthus fruit is really good. Humans eat it as well as gorillas. Um, and, and a few weeks later, there'll be seedlings. So that's the story, take, your take-home message. These animals are not just ornaments. And because they play this keystone role in ecosystems that are of global significance, not just for carbon sequestration and storage, the evapotranspiration that forests do puts water vapor into the air. I don't know if you can dim these lights, but this is a lovely animation. You can find it online. Um, let's look at T, uh, T341 rain, and you'll find it. And it shows the effect of the, the daily pulsing of the rainfall in the three tropical forest blocks of Amazonia, Africa, and, and the Southeast Asian islands, and how that feeds weather systems all over the world. Now, if you buy a bottle of wine from New Zealand, you can trace where the weather comes from. And perhaps a, price, a part of that price should be to protect the elephants that sow the seeds of the trees that evapotranspirate and put the water vapor into the atmosphere. Bringing ecosystem services into the general economy is the goal of Rebalance Earth. And these children have very little concept of that, but we can teach them. So education. And what, are, what is a community that's going to be paid for the services of the elephants going to do with the money that they suddenly have that they didn't have before? Better health, better education, a better quality of life. And we won't be doing it through philanthropy or governments using public money. There's always such a high demand, you know, every one of us pays taxes, we expect education, we expect health, we expect a well-run country, and if there's a bit left over, let's give it to the environment. No, we need to internalize the cost of protecting nature. And just remember, if you value the forest as we must, value the gardeners of the forest. Thank you.